Hey there, if you are looking for an unboxing video of one of these new fancy drones, uh, that's not what this is. I don't do unboxing videos in general. Uh, this is an engineer's perspective on the development of this product and what it is. So if you are considering buying one, there might be something in here that's useful to you. But uh, this is my smaller of my two channels where I go into more in-depth on stuff. And uh, for people that might be interested in going into engineering or just want some insight into engineering, and I'm going to use that insight, my 20 or so years of experience working as an engineer, to talk about the features of this thing and what must have gone into it. So uh, if you're interested in that, then keep on watching. Uh, number one, I am not an early adopter of stuff in general. I want other people to work through all the bugs and get things figured out so I'm not wasting my money on something that's going to be a bunch of problems. I don't like getting the latest phone and, and that kind of thing. But in this case, I've been looking at drones for years, uh, back from when they first introduced the first Phantom, and I just haven't quite been ready to pull the trigger. And then when they popped out with this thing and the new features that it has, I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it. So yeah, I've, I've got this thing in, in the first month that they are available. Now, regardless of what the product is, I'm here to tell you that when you are introducing a new product, it is painful. Just like birthing anything brand new is gonna hurt. And it's because whenever you change something, you are bringing up risk. If you're producing something that there's no risk, that you know it's gonna work and you have absolute certainty, then you're not doing anything new. That's just the definition of it. When you're doing something new, there is risk for the unknown and all the issues that are gonna come along with it. Now, number two, a lot of people look at a product and their perception of engineering is, okay, we're just gonna list out the things that it has to do. It has to be able to do X, Y, and Z, and we're gonna hire engineers and put them in a room and get some manufacturing equipment, and we're just gonna say, all right, design it to do these things, and then once it's designed, we'll produce it and start selling them. And that could not be further from the truth. Engineering is an incremental process. If you're working at a lawnmower producer, whether you're doing the design or the manufacturing of it, you are not just going to suddenly double the efficiency of your engine or your motor or make the thing weigh half as much or make it twice as appealing. It, it just doesn't work that way. It's little incremental changes. You know, for example, on this thing, there was already a, a DJI Mini, and this is the Mini 2, and what did they do? They improved the camera. They were able to uh, improve the flight time by just, you know, like a minute or something, uh, and, you know, bugs or the app that the customer uses to fly it and all that customer feedback they're getting, they're making incremental changes after, what, I think, 10 years of producing drones almost. They, they came out with the Phantom 1 back in 2013, which means they were developing it ahead of that time. So nearly 10 years of development, and this is the, the latest increment on all of those things. You, you can't just start from scratch. I mean, I'm, I'm a sharp guy, I've got a lot of experience, but for me to think that I could just jump into the drone world from scratch and produce something as good as this on my first try, is, is crazy and I guarantee you somewhere there is a dump truck full of 3D printed parts and uh, failed attempted molded parts and everything that went into the development of just this model of drone where they're, well, try this, try that and they're playing with it, oh, that didn't quite work out, that didn't quite work out and they're just tweaking it and tweaking it until they're finally able to produce these things by the thousands or, or the hundreds of thousands. If you are working for a company of any size at all, guarantee they're being approached by folks selling software or engineering services, claiming that, the, and here's what it goes like, okay, your last product introduction was painful, right? You had this issue and you had this issue and you had this issue. We have software and experienced engineers that are just going to give you a turnkey solution. We're, we're going to hand you this design that because of our experience and because of this fancy software that we've got, we're, we're going to do a vibrational analysis. We're going to do a thermal analysis. We're going to do a stress analysis. 
and by the time we hand you this finished design that is basically completely electronic, we're just handing you design files, you're just going to be able to, to start making those parts and produce it and you won't have any issues. And I'm sorry, man, that is just pie in the sky. That would be nice if that were the case, but it gets back to incremental engineering. You can't just design something like this from scratch. There are unforeseen problems that will pop up. And when you go to make your first 10 prototypes, you're going to get a batch of problems that pop up and then you'll solve those. And you're going to go make 25 or 50 in the next batch. And then there's going to be a whole bunch more new problems that didn't show up in the first one. And when you go make your first thousand, there's going to be, and by that time, there might be mostly, mostly manufacturing problems, but it's, it's going to happen. The unknown is going to pop up and mess up the works and you need to have people there to solve it. And the software, it, it's a great tool, like especially if you're already having a problem that you've identified and you're not sure exactly what's causing it, running that software may give you some kind of, you know, show you this peak in, in the vibration of this particular motor design that we didn't anticipate. It's like, oh, hey, okay, cool. And now you can, you, you can tweak the inputs to that software and see what the output is and then go try it to see if the real world is actually behaving like that software says it will. But yeah, I don't believe those claims of we're just going to give you this turnkey solution and everything's going to work fine and it's going to, the, the sun's going to come out and you're going to have a rainbow and the temperature's going to be perfect because that's not the real world. Uh, now, one of the other things that uh, we deal with when we have producing a product like this, no one person can do this. A team had to produce this thing. And I'm going to guess there were at least 10 core people working on the design and, and manufacture of this and they're human beings. They've all got their opinions on what the best way forward would be and they're naturally not going to agree with every other person on the team. Uh, for instance, you know, they're trying to hit this 249 gram weight so they stay under this 250 that the FCC requires you to register your drone. I mean, that had to have been, of those re design requirements, that had to have been like number one, we will not exceed this weight. And part of that is like, well, the battery that's in here. Uh, how do we make sure that this entire thing, the performance is there and that, it, that it's gonna work with that battery? Some people have may, may have said, well, we need to go with a smaller battery to make sure that when we upgrade with all these other things, the better camera or whatever, uh, that we're still going to be under that uh, weight. But then people are pushing back. So, well, then you won't have the power and you won't have the flight time. It's like, ah, people don't really care about flight time. They, they want this or that. And I guarantee you there, there were arguments back and forth. And uh, someone has to make the call, has to settle that disagreement and say, okay, let, let me hear everything that you have to say. You think it should be this. You think it should be that okay, let me think about it, or we're gonna go this path, and I need everybody to be on the team pursuing that as best you can. Somewhere in there, you've got different people working on parts that have to mate up, not just perfectly, but they have to handle the part-to-part uh, -part variation and still be able to function, and if it doesn't go together, you don't want the one person, well, my part was fine, it's that guy over there that didn't want to listen, and the other guy said, no, my part was fine, it was you that didn't want to listen, and, and, and the product doesn't work. Uh, that kind of stuff happens in a team, and you know, the better the people you have, the less it happens, but there still needs to be someone like oversight, that's able to look at it and see what's legit and what's not and still deal with the people problems, make the call and move forward so that you can have a successful product. Now, another issue uh, that is along the lines of that, like, like the weight of the 249 grams, uh, I mean, they did it. They, they hit that mark great. They're, they're well underneath that 250. And, but as I look at this thing, could it be lighter? Yeah, it, it, it totally could. I mean, let's, let's open this thing up for a second. Now, in engineering, when you design something to be strong enough to support a load, 
it's pretty simple. You just say, okay, like, like for this, it, it needs to be able to land, sit on the ground. And if this thing is less than 250 grams, then it's probably less than 70 grams of weight on any one of these landing points that, it, that it's sitting on. It's like, oh, okay, great. So I just need to design each of these legs to support a 70 gram load and my software can tell me how to do that or I can, I can do the loading and we'll be good to go. <laughs> and if you do that, you're gonna design something that the customer is not gonna be happy with because the fact is these arms are going to take a lot more load than just the weight or the the standard loading of it you're not actually designing it for the load of what it's going to do when it's flying what you're designing it for is when the customer takes it out of the bag and goes whoops and drops it and it lands all of that weight on one of these corners or uh, lands on its back or something you're trying to design it so that it meets or exceeds the oopsie that somebody's going to have. They're going to fly it into a tree. They're going to run it into a house. Uh, it's going to fall out of the sky. Who knows what, what it's going to do. And I know for me, when I drop something, I'm taking, you know, gosh, a, a camera or something out of a bag and no, uh, you know, it, it drops and, and hits something hard. Of course, it never, you, you would never expect it to survive landing on concrete. But then when it does, and you're like, wow, dang, nice job, engineers. And that is the case with this. I mean, yeah, each leg shouldn't have to support more than the uh, one quarter of the weight of it. Somebody's going to pick it up like this, and it has to be able to hold up to it. That means that this arm has to take more materials and be thicker than it would if it were just being designed to support the load. I remember one of my first jobs as an engineer right out of school was designing this rack that was going to support some tubing. And I went and did exactly what I'm describing. I did the stress analysis to figure out what material would just support the load. And one of the, I think it was one of the uh, machine operators that was looking at my design because I was getting his input on it. And he's like, um, hey, you might want to look around at all the other racking and things that are in this big shop because, you know, the, the legs were all folded in and people are driving forklifts around. I had done all this stress analysis work and designed it with little tube steel. And based on his input, I upgraded it to the size of all the other racks that were in the area, which was like double the size. Instead of a two by two support, I went with a two by four square tube. And I'm glad that I did because it wasn't two weeks, I think, after that thing was produced. They wanted to, to paint the floor. And I watched as a forklift operator. He's, a, he's a, uh, one of the best forklift drivers I've ever seen. But he picked up that rack to move it and was going around a corner. And the whole thing, just metal on metal, it slid off. And I watched that whole rack just clang, 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 clang <laughs> doing somersaults across the, the asphalt. And it made me glad, like it was, it hurt to watch that, but those are the kind of things that you have to design for. And if you're just focused on the load, the actual design load that it's gonna be taking, then uh, it's, it's not gonna hold up when those other oopsies inevitably happen. Now, I could take this thing, I promise you right now, I could make this thing lighter than, this, this could be the lightest DJI Mini 2 on the planet. I could grab my drill and come in here on these arms and start putting in some lightning holes to start taking this thing out. I could take this from a 249 gram drone to a 248, guaranteed. But again, they wanted to make this thing tough enough to handle whatever people are going to do to it and then some. And that brings up another point of bookshelf technology, they call it. Uh, DJI has been making drones for a long time and like these, this, this pivoting mechanism of uh, the arms on it is probably been recycled from earlier drones. And I'm telling you, this thing, you could use this strong of a joint on, on a drone easily twice this size and never have a problem with it. But it's probably the same design that they've been using on all the way back to the Mavic and, and when, when they first started folding 
the doing folding drones so that they would get smaller. And there are huge, huge advantages to recycling that design. Anytime you go modify something, hey, I'm going to make this better. I'm going to, I'm going to tweak it and make it cheaper. Uh, all the way from the people manufacturing the parts, whether it's a die cast part or injection molded or machined or even the, the fastener that gets used, if you're tweaking it, human beings have to adapt to that. And I mean, just think about the assembly of these things. If someone is accustomed to assembling with a certain fastener and certain parts in a certain way, and you go design some new nifty design that's gonna go together in a different manner, they might put the wrong fastener in, they're just, they're used to doing it a certain way and changing that up confuses them. I know in my designs, I am always looking for what has worked, what do we have a long history of success on and if there's ever a time that I can recycle it and reuse it in this new design it minimizes my risk and makes it less confusing for everybody downstream of me that's going to be manufacturing it and putting it together. All of that said looking at this product the the end product of what they produce they did an amazing job. Us humans you know we're, we're a bunch of primates on this ball spinning through space and with all of our emotional baggage and personal conflicts and things, the fact that they surpassed all of that stuff and made this amazing product is really, really impressive. I took this thing and I'll show you some of the footage now that I've been taking with it. Uh, took this out, flew it over my neighborhood. I went to my folks with it. They live on the coast in the, the outskirts of a little podunk town on the coast and flew around over the peaks around their, their house or the, the valley they're in. And my wife had suggested, hey, get it up in the air and see if you can see the sunrise when it's coming up. And sure enough, just beautiful, beautiful images of the sunrise. Uh, the return to home function, I, I don't know if you've heard the stories of some of the original drones where you had to set the home position when you first fire the thing up so that in case it loses the signal, that it knows where to go. It's gonna use GPS and, and turn around and come back uh, but people would take it to their vacation destination, uh, going somewhere overseas, and they lose signal, and they, their home is still back at their home, and the thing takes off and starts flying, trying to, trying to fly across the ocean to find their way back home, and ends up just like, it's not going to make it. Well, they just rode it in to where it automatically sets its new home, with where you're taking off from. And if it's not able to get a clear GPS signal, it's like, eh, warning, you could fly this, but I really recommend you don't until I get this new new home position. So the fact that they, they figured all that stuff out, they've incrementally found their way to this just amazing product. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is impressive and I'm really glad that I got it. Now, like I said at the beginning, this is my smaller channel. If you're stumbling on this because you're interested in the drone, uh, this is my just however many thousand subscribers when I've got this other, this is build two. I've got uh, Quint Builds that is hundreds of thousands of subscribers at this point that has all kinds of cool projects. This is where I throw the more nerdy things that people want to see the details that, uh, that they're willing to sit through hearing me talk about the the stuff that typical engineers are working on from day to day. So if you haven't seen the other channel, go check that out. I'll put a link in the description. But uh, hopefully some of you folks found this useful. Uh, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.